Hello, Agnes. Hi, Robin. I had a f intuition that we're going to test here. And my intuition was we should just try a really big topic that we haven't thought or discussed much about because we often just go big anyway. And we often do okay when we talk about things that we haven't really, you know, have prior positions on or staked out arguments, or whatever. We just jump in and see what we can do. So I thought we'd pick a really big topic. And I was thinking of war or God. And I thought, well, God is bigger, I guess. It's a bigger topic. So fine. Let's talk God. So that's my intuition. Let's talk God. Okay. Uh, I was just reading an argument for the existence of God, just like five minutes ago. Can I read you the argument? Okay. Okay. It's by Borges. It's called The Ornithological Argument for the Existence of God. I close my eyes and see a flock of birds. The vision lasts a second or perhaps less. I don't know how many birds I saw. Were they a definite or an indefinite number? This problem involves the question of the existence of God. If God exists, the number is definite because how many birds I saw is known to God. If God does not exist, the number is indefinite because nobody was able to take count. In this case, I saw fewer than 10 birds, let's say, and more than one, but I didn't see nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, or two birds. I saw a number between 10 and one, but not nine, eight, seven, six, five, et cetera. That number as a whole number is inconceivable, ergo God exists. Feels like you're missing a step just before that last ergo. <laughs> What's the step? Well, you, you, um, why, why must there be a God? <laughs> Just because there's a image in your mind that doesn't have a number of birds. So I think that Borges' thought is um, that if you have, let's say, a representation of a set of objects, and then there are facts about those objects that would be true if you were to encounter them in the world, those same sorts of facts have to be true of the objects in the representation. But since you can't know them, the only God could know such facts. So there must be like the sort of being that would have access to, um, you know, access to your mental image to be able to say uh, there were seven birds. So is the an axiom here the idea that Every fact must be known by somebody. <laughs> so, that seems really, there have to be infinite beings. So it's like in math, we have infinity of facts. If every fact would have to be explicitly known by somebody, then we need an infinite being to be able to know all the infinite facts right there. Right. That's going to give you God for math, right? He's assuming something like every fact is such that there must be at least one person, one being who could know it. Who could know it or who does know it? Who could know it. But like the problem is with this fact, Borges's image of birds, only God could know it because it's already over with. Borges doesn't know how many birds oh. it was and nobody else saw the image. So, I mean, that sounds to me like the if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? The idea that a sound only exists in the mind and it doesn't like exist in a world without a mind. This sounds like we're saying facts don't make sense unless there's a mind to, to understand them. We can't imagine a world of facts without a mind to understand each or could, a, who could know each fact. Right. So you might think, um, the kind, like there could clearly be a vibration in the air without there being anyone around. Right. Um, but, a sound is like the counterpart of hearing. It's the sort of thing which is such as to be heard, or a color is the sort of thing which is such as to be seen. And likewise, Borges is suggesting a fact is the sort of thing which is such as to be known. So there must be some knower if there is a fact. It seems to me like you, you could define this concept of fact such that there has to be a knower of it, but surely there's an adjacent concept of fact where there isn't a knower. And then I just need a word for that so I could talk about that. And then I could say, well, there's that kind of fact, but it's not obvious there's the other kind. And then I would be allowed to question the existence of God by saying, well, you have to show me that 
there's this other kind of fact because you have to show me there's a network that knows this. It's just not an axiom that everything would be known, uh, that every it's, it's you interesting know, potential to be the, fact would be known. You're going that way. You could go another way too, which is just um, maybe there's no fact of the matter about how many birds Borges saw. Sure. That's another way of saying it. Yeah. General principle that he's applying. Um, it's like, suppose I had a dream and in my dream there was a chair and a table. His principle says, well, either the chair was heavier than the table or the table right. was heavier than the chair. Now, I might not know which, but God knows or something. And you might just think, right. no, there's just no fact of the matter. My dream just wasn't fully filled out. And likewise, his bird image just wasn't a full or complete representation. Um, and so you might think, yeah, for every fact, it at least could be known by some being. But, but there might just not be a fact here. Right. So I feel like, you know, the idea that God is a big topic isn't really well represented by this particular topic <laughs> in which God shows up. Okay. That so, is, you know, the, how would you like to approach God? Well, I mean, there's, there's, I guess you could say one set of topics is, is there a God and how would you know? Mm -hmm. And another set of topics is what difference would it make? Okay, we were addressing the first set of topics. Right. Argument for the existence of God. Right, it just it wasn't a very good one. I mean, if we were going to say, how would we know? That's not where I would go. I mean, I doubt it is for you either. That's not how you would try to answer the question. <laughs> um, I actually don't think it's crazy to think of God as the knower par excellence. Um. So I accept the part of Borges' argument that says, um, if this were knowable, someone would have to be able to know it. And if only God could know it, then God would have to exist. I just think actually it isn't knowable. So uh, okay, I don't just, I don't think it's a totally wrong-headed argument. We just but, stand back and we said, what, is there a God? What would be the sort of evidence that would be most likely to be relevant to that? What, you know, that isn't where I, my mind would go. Right. Um, but it feels like, how much does it matter is actually a more is a bigger question um in the sense that i mean uh, you know for some people god is an authority not just a power so that seems an interesting distinction um to what extent is a vast power something you should defer to in your judgments or your morals or things like that um, people have often put those together, but in ways they don't do for more limited powers. Like if we talk about the most powerful government on earth, people don't feel like, well, I should defer to the most powerful government on earth because it's, you know, the most powerful, but for the most powerful creature, they feel more inclined to defer to it. What, you know, like a question, if, if all we know is there's a vastly powerful creature out there, then the question is, what, what else would that imply of interest? I guess I don't think a vastly powerful creature is a good definition of God. I think a completely good creature, say, that will at least be equally um, uh, good. And so the thought is... Um, people want to defer to God, not because God is so powerful, but because God is so good. So it sounds like that concept of good needs some concept of capacity. So if we imagine like the smallest possible creature, it only ever makes one action and then it ends. And its action just has binary options. There's A or B, there's the only two things, and it chooses the better action. So in some sense, it's perfectly moral. It only had one possible action and it took the better one. And so... It, you, there's nothing to criticize more about its morality is that it make the perfect choice. It's perfectly good and by one metric. It, it only had one choice and it did the right thing, but it's not the sort of thing you're going to want to defer to. So it would seem like that concept of a good creature isn't what you mean by the perfectly good creature. It, you want a creature that also has a lot of capacity to do a lot of things, and then it makes the better choices. That's better. Aristotle's God is a knower that only does one thing, um, think, and it only thinks about one thing itself or thought. So Aristotle's God is thought thinking itself. And it's 
perfect and it's just like your examined creature of only doing one action except it just continuously it's not like it does it and then it stops got aerosol's got us continuously doing this action because it's like that's a slightly better version of the creature you described is one that's going to continuously do it uh and aristotle thinks that is perfect that being is perfect and the entire universe models itself in imitation of this one thing and tries to be as much like it as possible so for instance all the planets orbit in spheres because going around in a circle is like the closest that they can get to um this divine um activity um and that we ourselves do things like engage in politics and philosophy in sort of leisurely ways that are imitative of this divine being so clearly i don't understand enough about the space of possible gods uh, that have been posited in the world in history because i have a christian background and i guess somewhat a physics background so i can understand the sort of gods that christians and physicists and i guess ai researchers imagine there's the ai gods that people imagine um and so i guess maybe so i don't really understand this god you're describing but the more you're going to push on it I get more I gonna go oh I guess we do need to talk about what the chance of God is because really there's a lot of different kinds of gods and we need to be talking about well if there's any sort of God which kind would it be yeah so um Aristotle's God shows up in his physics um as the linchpin the causal linchpin of the universe so for him God is a concept in physics um also in metaphysics um and the thought is that there's all this activity going on all around us and um there's it seems to be aiming at goals and ends but there's like a perfect version of all of that and that's what god is supposed to instantiate and so that's the sense in which god is the causal linchpin aristotle's god i don't want us to talk about what aristotle thought i want okay. us to talk about what we think so I could try to describe the closest thing I could imagine to there being a God, or you could describe what you could think the closest thing you could imagine to be. That is, we should be talking about what we think is actually the most likely thing that's relevant here, not what Aristotle thought. So, so, you know, I might think the universe is big and there could have been some powers earlier in the universe before we saw that structured the universe that we see, and then maybe had some agendas for the universe. That's the sort of thing I can imagine, given my worldview. I can also imagine that in the future, there will be sort of our descendants who become more and more capable and then become like gods eventually. And then they might have their purposes and their plans, et cetera. And that's a kind of God I can imagine. So those are two kinds of gods that I can fit into my worldview. Uh, but they don't sound very much like the ones you were talking about. So Borges God, who knows everything inside our head, and Aristotle's God, whose perfectly leisured activity, they're both imaginable to me as conceptions of God. A lot of um, conceptions of God seem to me to be um, like, um, human beings, but with like a lot of like wish fulfillment packed in about yeah. like, uh, like superheroes, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So it, I find it easier to imagine Borges as God and Aristotle's God as God oh. than like the superhero God as God, which just seems to me like a superhero. Right. So I'm not so interested in various possible concepts of God. I'm more interested in actual gods. That is not what concepts of God can you imagine, but like what gods do you think might actually exist? And talk about those gods, if there are such things. I mean, if we if we can decide pretty surely they're just if there's nothing like God, then it becomes a less interesting topic. But it seems like initially one should consider what sort of things would be the closest to gods out so there. So what what gods do you think exist? Well, I just mentioned two. That is the two gods I could most likely conceive of actually existing. One would be some early mover in the history of our universe, some intelligent power that was existed very early in the universe and then made some big choices about the universe we see, who's, who are then we are, you know, living through the consequences of, and then they may have anticipated something like us as 
consequences of their actions. That's one kind of God I can imagine. Another kind of God I can imagine is the other end of space-time, <laughs> the future. Our descendants will slowly grow in capacity and, and intelligence and um, inclination and all sorts of ways we maybe can't imagine now. And then at the end of that process, whatever that thing is, looks an awful lot like a God. <laughs> it's, it's maximally capable in many ways. Um, so that's, those are two kinds of, I mean, the second kind of God, I think I'm more sure of in some sense, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that eventually there will be something like that in the long run. The first kind is possible, at least, at least it fits in my world view. Um, I mean, there's other kinds of gods would be like, if say we live in a simulation, simulation argument, then whoever's running the simulation, they're kind of like gods. Th those are gods I can at least you know, fit into my worldview and talk about them actually existing. But if you have other ones, I'm willing to consider. Um, so, um, so what you mean by God is a very powerful being. A very X being many, with many kinds of X's, right? Power is just one of a, one of the X's, but what yes. are the other properties that make the beings that you've described divine besides power? All of the, um, you know, presumably there's things that correlate with power, at least in my concept of the world, they would have capacities. I mean, maybe power is not all capacities. So if you think of non-power capacities, they have those too. Yeah. There's many things they can do. Then there's knowledge and wisdom. They just know many things. They have thinking abilities. That's a capacity, so they are able to do a lot of very thorough. How do you know that about them? Like the the one that started everything. So there's the, basically you have two kinds of gods: the gods at the beginning and the gods at the end of the story. And uh, so why think that either of them knows stuff? That is, it seems like from the fact that the thing got everything started it doesn't follow that it knew what it was doing and from the fact that these are the things at the end of the spectrum and maybe they get to live for a really long time it doesn't follow that they know what they're doing so the future ones are the ones i can most anchor in my understanding of everything and for those it seems like well they could know as many things as were possible to know that is in my sense of how you could ever know anything they have the maximal opportunity and capacity to know things that could be known. If there's something that they don't or know or can't know, I don't see how they could or could be known by anyone ever. As this is a sort of a maximally possible creature. And then my my image of a prior creature at the beginning of time is really somewhat derived from, you know, some future like ours having happened in the past. And we are past that distant past you know so there was a distant past maybe more like ours and then those that past evolved to this mac near maximal creature who then created our universe knowing that at least initially the capacities in that universe would be much more limited before something like us came along and we moved to our descendants but uh but i mean isn't it just possible that um like even at a time when almost everything is known the beings have very little interest in knowing it and are inhabiting a world where their knowledge of it isn't that important to their success and thus they don't know it maybe they could know it if they wanted to um, but if it's a big enough world i think that some parts of it will know it so you know, I have, a, I have a mental model of how it is that a large universe that was very capable would share things they knew. And so part of that is this idea that if you know something well uh, and it's simple enough, then you can just express it and share it with others. And it would be relatively cheap for one part of a vast future to find out a thing and share it in a way that would be available to others, even if they don't bother to look at it. So that's a sense in which I mean they know things. Not that they're constantly paying attention to the things that they know, but it's available to them. 
but you might um and take a um uh a book or something right so imagine that um one one way for five people to have knowledge of the book is like all five have read it and another way would be each reads one fifth of it um okay. and um and so whenever like the in the second scenario um you know i say i read the second fifth right whenever stuff comes up that requires knowledge of the second fifth i show up and right i, I deal with those things right yep. um so you can ima i could at least imagine a, a a future world where knowledge like looks like that where there's just a lot of specialization and yeah. like nobody knows everything nobody even knows many things people know very very few things but they're really well organized um and so these gods that you're describing barely know anything. That, that 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 seems imaginable. Okay. So now we're talking about different possible imagined futures. So I draw a circle around the whole thing and I, you know, inclusively label it as knowing a lot of things. But of course, there is the question of which parts of it know how much and how easily those are shared among the parts. That just seems to me questions of what kind of future gods there would be. So... Uh, right. What what I what I was suggesting is that power and knowledge are separate. They're separate concepts. And your concept of God is the concept of something that has certain sorts of powers. And then there's independent questions about is that thing good and does it know stuff? Right. So I'm just coming from my worldview of the kinds of things I know about uh, in order to construct a thing like God that fits into my worldview. And that thing like God is a you know, a world of descendants who have a lot of capabilities and a lot of things they know in some senses, but I'm open to considering different hypotheses about how that could be arranged and how they could make use of that. And this is all, I don't have very strong commitments about this, um, but see, I mean, the question is, well, how much does any of those variations matter? That That's the second question about how much does a God matter? How much does this sort of a God matter? Um, Okay, well, let, let's go to that question then. Yeah, so this is how you're imagining. I mean, I know you're saying you're very open, but I made two suggestions that you were not open to. So well, those, I didn't <laughs> see where they could show up in the universe. That is, okay, I always... You're open to things where you could see how they would show up in your yes, world. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah, but I'm not sure I can point. produce those because I have a different worldview. So let's just stick with the things that you, you know, you're definitely open to, which is the suggestions you've made. Um, and uh, so... Um, so what would it matter if these two different gods existed? Well, if for any question we have now, there'll be some part of the future who will know the answer, then we might set up interesting social processes by which we connect our processes of inquiry now to these distant future settlements of the question. That's at least a way we can use those gods we can they can settle bets for example we could bet on the answers to questions and eventually wait for them to settle our bets that's a way we could use such gods for the kinds of questions that we could expect them to have an answer to so if we don't think they will have an answer to all possible questions then we ask then now we start to ask well which of the many questions we have do we expect them to eventually have available an answer to Your your god turns out to be quite similar to Borges' god, the one who knows everything, and have a similar function, namely to like well, determine things that we don't know. It's it's one of many possible functions, perhaps, but I mean it's it's certainly an identifiable one. So we're 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 struggling to find a way it matters. Yes. So the god who started everything in the universe, the way that it might matter, there's there's, well, it might matter because. It had some plans and intentions for us, and maybe we could find out what those are. And maybe somehow by accommodating ourselves to those plans, certain things will go more smoothly because, you know, this god has figured out those plans and, you know, in ways that we haven't figured out. That's a classic role of God, if I understand it, religion, is... You have a complicated world and a lot of issues that you don't know how to deal with. And there's this God who already thought worked it all through and has a plan for you. And if you learn their plan and rely on it, some things may go better. 
Presumably, if God already has a plan for you, his plan includes your learning about the plan or not. Indeed. So, like, maybe doesn't... maybe God's plan was you're not learning about the plan or you're resisting his plan or whatever you do. Sure. I guess that was God's plan. So it doesn't seem like it'd be that useful. I mean, a plan isn't a thing that must always have happened. Uh, that's not what I mean by a plan here. Mm -hmm. So, like, if your parents... In a world of relatively stable careers, your parents might have a plan for your future career, and then you might be well advised to listen to their plan for your career, but you would have the option to ignore it and go your own way, and then you might know that you would be less relying on their advice and their wisdom of the plan they had set up for you. So I, I'm not thinking of a deterministic you know, plan that was something you couldn't possibly violate. I, I was just thinking of some sort of intention like help god out by making god's dreams come true yeah sure that makes sense to me in this sense of there was somebody who had a plan for the universe so like it, this makes much less sense to me of an individual's personal life plan it, this is to me much more would make sense you know this god set up the universe with certain physical parameters and they expected certain kinds of life to evolve and do certain kinds of things and maybe if you figure out what those were then maybe we collectively could at least have some rough idea what the plan was for us but that doesn't tell you how to what career to do or when to get married or things like that it's more about all of us but that would be at least the sort of thing you might think this old god could do have a role they could have for us i mean i think that um the question of whether you want god's dreams to come true is going to be a function of whether you think god's dreams are good and so it doesn't seem like enough that God is, even if God is very powerful and God set up the world with certain reward systems so that if you do the things that God wants, you'll get those rewards. You can still ask, are those rewards good? Do I yes. want the things yes. that God exactly. called rewards? Um, and so the thought, it'll go more smoothly. It'll go more godly. Um, but right. um, there's just still a question, is that good or not? And so it seems to me you've got to add in and the being that created everything was good and made good plans that we would want to realize. You'll want to ask the question whether you can legitimately add that in to your worldview is, is more precisely the issue here. So, yes, I think, again, I'm starting with a standard, you know, physics, computer science view of the world. And I'm looking in that view for the closest things that could look like gods. And the things I could find would be powerful, knowledgeable creatures. And then you say, oh, but I'm looking for good creatures. And I say, yes, I can see why you'd want to do that. But now I am, you know, up to the usual obstacle that we don't know particularly how to find those. We know maybe how to predict and find powerful creatures and knowledgeable creatures. But how do we find good creatures? No, I, we I know that just presupposing that. God was good. I was saying that you were looking for um, implications of the knowledge, say, that this beginning of the story, God, was there. And you wanted there to be an implication about what I do, that I might then try to realize this God's plans. And I was claiming you don't have enough premises to get to that conclusion. You need to add another one which is that that God is good. If you don't, it's up to you if you want to add that right. conclusion or not. But if you don't, you don't get the implication. But that was my point of the parents. Like, if you know that your parents' plans are done with more knowledge of the world than your plans, you'll know that their plans will go more smoothly, but you don't know that they're good plans just because they're your parents. So that was the concept of smooth versus other criteria. So that, that the reason I gave that analogy is exactly for that point. You don't know that you embrace the goals or the the criteria being used, but you would be able to roughly guess that things would go more smoothly. That, that's why I'm I use sure those what's words. meant by smoothly there. I just meant more reflecting a detailed knowledge of the context. So so actions that reflected, you know, if somebody's plan includes both 
a lot of knowledge of context and some overall priorities. You know, know if you embrace the priorities, but you could at least know, at least it's going to go more smoothly in the sense of not being surprised and, and thwarted by various details of the content. So say we're, um, we're in the lair of a torturer and the torturer is like, has their victim in front of them. And the torturer is like, I'm really great at torturing. And I've really worked out this whole approach. And so I'm going to tell you how to do it, how to torture this person. And I'm just going to, I have a lot of like fine grained information. So like your tort, you know, what you do is going to go more smoothly yep. if you go along with what I say, because I know how to torture. Right. And then the thought is like, it's right. So, so that would be a way of, it would go more smoothly, but you might say, yeah, but that's not anything that smoothly is not a value. It's not a plus. It's not a positive in this case, when you're torturing the person, when your parents give you advice, you, um, I mean, unless you like, don't think your parents are good, which some people, you know, and then they would just dismiss it. You think your parent, you and your parents share a conception of the good and of what's valuable. And so what is achieved smoothly is a good thing. Um, but if we're not going to presuppose that with God, then you have no more reason to do uh, what's smoothly uh, achieves God's purposes than what smoothly achieves the torturer's purposes. And we might ask, what reason do you have to think that you share your parents' concept of what's good? I mean, sure, that's some people don't, and it's a totally reasonable question. But my point is, if you didn't think you did, you would ignore their advice. You wouldn't take I, it. I'm completely agreeing with you. Considerations. I, I agree with you. I, I don't. I'm, I didn't mean for the smoothness comment to be, you know, pointing some huge resolution of things. But it's at least a, a thing you could say. We're struggling here I to find think anything. It's a consideration to say. in favor. That is, I think it counts for zero. I don't, I, I don't, if you, if you don't share the values of some being, then you have zero. Reason. Okay. But it, but it is a compliment to sharing values of being. Once you do share some values, sure. it's an That's added exactly thing. That's why I said you might want to assume, you, not me, you might want to assume that this God is good. Then you get some results as to what you should do. Otherwise you don't get any results. So, you know, I guess the conversation here is focusing on, we can imagine processes which would produce powerful and knowledgeable creatures in the world. How do we think about what processes would produce good creatures in the world that would also have substantial power or knowledge? If we lack any sort of way to draw conclusions about where we would find such creatures or in what sorts of situations they would arise, then we are stuck we are not going to find the sort of God that's of interest for those purposes. So if we don't have any other way to guess where in the universe would be good, powerful, knowledgeable creatures compared to just powerful, knowledgeable creatures, then um, whatever purposes a God who was good would be to us, we don't, we aren't going to be able to realize that advantage because we're not going to know how to find it. Unless there's a way to just check a god and see if it happens to be good against some other standards we could find to test our gods to see if we they can earn our respect. Is that a way to think about God? Is that we need to find candidate gods and then test them to see if they live up to our god standards? That's what Abraham does. Um, you know, in uh, uh, when um, God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham is like, well, what if there were like like 20 good men there? Would you still destroy it? And God's like, OK, I would save the 20. He's like, what if there were 10? Um, yeah. It, it You can read that as a, a test of God. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of negotiations that happen in Genesis. Um uh, where like Abraham and uh, not so much Isaac, but Abraham and Jacob are asking themselves the question, am I going to let this God be my God? Because they're in a world of implicitly right. many gods. That's been, you know, that's been whitewashed out of the Bible, but that's right, the yeah. world that they're in. And, and uh, the, um, yeah, I guess there is a question like, is, do you want this God to be your God? So as you may know, I've, in the last few years, I did this work on grabby aliens, 
And then I tried to extend that sort of analysis to UFOs to say, well, if UFOs were aliens, what kind of aliens would they be in order to sort of work out a most likely scenario there? And in that scenario, those these questions would seem to be directly relevant. Uh, that is, once you're convinced there are these very powerful, presumably very knowledgeable aliens around, and that they have some sort of a plan for us, which is part of the story, now you have to ask, but do you think they're good? And now you'd ask, well, how would you test the UFO aliens to see if they're good, to see whether you should want to believe their plan and follow it? That's that's a pretty grand but somewhat concrete application of what we're discussing, because at least this is a plausible God who, who would have powers and knowledge and plans, and this is exactly the key question. Do you trust them? But it, um, I mean, if I'm recall your view about this their their whole plan is going to be to uh stay far away from us and not let us do anything like testing them because they're you know green and have 75 arms or other things that we they know we wouldn't like and so we wouldn't really be able to test them well we might find it hard but th there's a variety of hypotheses but there then there's there are some things we do know about them can you use those as tests you have some things you know can, are they suitable for tests? So, for example, they've clearly chosen not to intervene in life on Earth much. Does that pass our test? Would a good alien inter have intervened in the history of life on Earth war? I, I think that there's two real criteria about gods, again, if you ask when well, we're testing them, what are we testing them for? Um, it seems to me that there's at least two things. One of them is being happy. You want God to be happy, right? Like if God's miserable, that that's okay. that's hardly a God. Um, you want God to have a kind of existence that you would envy. Um, and then you want God to be um, sort of kind or something like that, like uh, to um to be a good citizen in the universe of beings those are the two things i can think of as to what we would want out of god and so that's what we would want to know about these aliens are they happy and are they kind but for the kindness the main evidence we have is that there was a bunch of suffering that happened here that they didn't do much about right so, so this is a this is an old problem, not only about yes. your alien gods, but about all gods. That's Indeed. the problem of evil. And, um, but it's, you know, it's not as though that problem has led everybody to stop believing in God, though it did lead a lot of people to stop believing in God. But, um, um, you want, but you and I, it's still an open choice, right? Whether we believe in the alien gods because they didn't help us. Um, yeah. Because so we might find, sorry, because they weren't kind in this right. concrete way. Um, right. Well, so like, it seems to us that they weren't kind. Um, um, you know, you, one thing you might say is, well, you know, in their greater wisdom, um, they may have been protecting us in some more, in some deeper way by allowing some bad things. As long as we don't think of them as omnipotent, which is the, why you get into real trouble with the problem of e the traditional problem of evil. As long as we don't think of them as omnipotent, we can think that they are kind even though they don't help us. We could think that, but should we? That is, even if we can identify a logical possibility, we still have to ask how believable that is. Right. I think that... We think of the moderns as not believing in gods, and here we're talking about a few kinds of gods maybe moderns could believe in, but maybe the as big a difference is we are less inclined to defer to the gods. So not only did the ancients believe in gods, but they were more willing to presume that the gods were good. And here we are getting close to situations where if we did believe in gods, we just aren't getting close to believing they're good. 
we are we're holding our own standards for what they, they think is good and we look at them and we go you haven't convinced me and how could they convince us really is it is it that the moderns less that we we don't believe that there are vast powerful knowledgeable creatures and more that we are less willing to, to give them the benefit of the doubt for being good one way to understand the idea of human rights and you know fundamental human dignity and the 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 being owed respect um and the idea like as kant puts it that each of us is a member in a non-physical kingdom of ends is just that every human being is a god that what we discovered you know over the course of let's say christianity and then the enlightenment is that we are a kind of god a kind of mortal god and that's why there's like we're sacred and our lives are sacred they're holy and uh so you have to treat people in certain ways because you're dealing with a god and now once we think of ourselves as gods then you know that kind of brings god down to earth literally and so we're a little bit less willing to say to be totally in awe of some new supposed god it's more like a peer. Even one that's vastly more powerful or knowledgeable than us, still, we aren't willing to defer them so much because on this key question of how good they are, we're not so convinced. Right. Or at least convinced the question that we're is, how are they going to treat us? Because even though we're way less powerful than them, we're gods. And so they have to respect us. They have to um, acknowledge our dignity, et cetera. Um, where, like, Aristotle's God didn't have to do any of those things. Aristotle's God, complete and total indifference to every living being. I right? couldn't care less. That's just not what Aristotle's God's about. Aristotle's God's about itself. Um, but we live in a world where that kind of a God doesn't make sense to us anymore. Um, they'd have to be nice to us, maybe, because we think of ourselves as gods. Did, did the gods of the ancients believe that they needed to treat all gods with some certain minimal level of respect? Was that a thing that the ancients thought about their gods? I'm not sure which ancients you're talking about. If you're talking about like the Homeric gods, I mean, they're just a lot like people, but they are like people to the extent that they get quite indignant when they're not treated respectfully. So um, now you might think that's the divine aspect of human beings to start out with, that kind of indignation. Well, thinking that you are being not treated as well as you deserve is not the same as thinking that everybody deserves to be treated with some minimal level of respect for example well, I mean, slavery for example and they so the clear... i'm talking about the the gods right how, how, yeah. how should a god be treated and i think right. the gods did all think that the other gods deserve to be treated with a certain level of respect so gods enslaving gods would have been disapproved so they approved of human slavery but they would have disapproved of gods enslaving gods i mean the gods did all kinds of terrible stuff to each other and whether or not it was approved of depends on the story and on who's point okay. of view you're looking at but so but there are these two different theories of what's changed one theory is that w we used to think there were these few gods up there and the rest of us weren't gods and then we changed our mind to decide we were gods too but another theory perhaps added to that is a, that we had a new theory about how gods should treat each other and maybe that wasn't the theory back then but now we've decided not only are we all gods all gods need a certain minimal treatment. Yeah, I think that that's right. Um, that's what I think what's sometimes known as negative theology. That is the idea that this is what something would have to be in order to qualify as a god, in order to be good enough to count as a god, so that like Zeus and Hera, they just, they, no matter how powerful they are, they can't be gods because they they don't behave in a godlike fashion. They're, un, they're undignified as gods. So this whole view seems fragile to the possibility of our introducing a whole slew of new kinds of creatures that vary across all these parameters in a wide range of hard to anticipate ways. That is, as we're making, say, artificial intelligence over the next centuries, we'll add a whole bunch of creatures who vary enormously as we choose in terms of not just their power and their knowledge, but their, you know, sense of goodness and how they treat each other and us and et cetera. And so which of them are gods? What What is the criteria for being 
a god once we look at this new larger space of creatures that we will create. Maybe a god is like a very powerful being, but it's okay. Where in most cases, the the idea that there's some very powerful being out there is not okay. It's like a threat to you. Well, then what what makes it okay is another version of the question. Because that's, right. of course, the current AI risk discussion is many people want by default to think new creatures out there are by default not okay. And so it's not good to create new creatures out there who are potentially powerful. Right. So this shows you that they're okay. What you're right. What you would have to do to persuade those people is just show them that they, they would be gods. Then they'd be okay with it. But then um, but that's brings us that question, what is a god exactly? What what counts what is it to count as a god? Can these these things count as a god? So some minimal level of power and knowledge or some minimal level of goodness or some minimal level of respect for other gods? William James lists belief in God alongside, say, like um, faith and trust in other people as the sort of fact that will only come if you first believe in it. And so maybe there's a kind of problem with setting something up as a god because um, you need to... Um, you need to already believe in it in order to receive the evidence that this God exists. And so, for example, we all just kind of come on the scene already believing in human rights and in human dignity and that it's just immoral to treat people in certain ways. And basically everyone in our world believes that in a very deep way without it needing to ever be explained to them. But historically, it wasn't always true. So Exactly, right. No, I'm change saying... across the time, right? Right. Absolutely. That's my point. My point is that um, these divine beings, they, um, the belief in them, you don't walk your way. It's like, um, um, the Grand, does the Grand Canyon exist? You could come to believe that by just going, walk, wandering one day and you run into the Grand Canyon. You're like, oh, I guess it exists. But maybe God is not that sort of a thing, not that sort of a fact. Um, it, it's more like the fact of like, you know, can I trust Robin? Um, well, like, am I going to hold myself back and be really, really, really suspicious of you until the day when you prove that I can trust you? If that happens, I'm going to act all suspiciously all the time and you're never going to trust me and or be trustworthy right. to me and I'll never encounter the fact, the fact of your trustworthiness. In order to encounter that fact, I have to just first believe in it. Uh, and so with the AIs, maybe it'll only be our descendants who will be in a position to believe in them as gods. Maybe the ship has sailed for us. So sounding a bit like a social impossibility. Uh, that is, it might be literally impossible for something to convince you to trust it and that it deserves to be treated as a god, but that sometimes you just grant that the the conditions have been met anyway and go on. I mean, that, right. That, that makes it sound as though there's some act of granting that happens. Well, there might be some event some process that happens might it may be, be essential act. that you never notice it happening and that it's not there's not some event as far as you know sure but there's like a process then uh something yeah. happens and then you get into the habit of accepting that the condition has been met and then for all practical purposes it has been even if there was never a point in time when you were skeptical and then you checked the conditions and changed your mind on the basis of checking conditions. Right. I think it's plausible that God is like, in that way, akin to promising and forgiveness and all these other things we've talked about, eroticism, um, and thus that, you know, once we're playing the game of what evidence do you have to give me that you're a real God, we've already, like, we're already out of the God game. So the, the problem with, say, AI is that, you know, we might be able to fill the world around us with literally trillions of little things that in some pr in principle deserves to be treated as gods, but now it's just a lot more trouble 
to go around constantly respecting so many things. <laughs> it's like, you know, people talk about ants, but like ants aren't really that common compared to lots of other things in our world, like germs or something. Like if every germ in our world deserved to be treated as a god, well, how do you do that, right? It just seems overwhelming. Yeah, that might be a reason to not create so many things, to make it manageable. And you might predict that the highly our highly religious descendants will be very motivated by that. Not to make very many things. Yeah, to make only so many things as they can respect. But it might be pretty hard to draw those lines. With, you know, what's the minimum size thing you're allowed to create? Um, sure, but like it's as it is, it's really hard to know how to respect someone and how to treat them with respect. And you know, we do our best, but. It's not like we don't try just because it's hard to know exactly how to draw the line. So I'll just plant the flag of I'm not yet convinced that we are gods or that all gods deserve to be treated with respect because I'm not even sure what a god is exactly. But I, I understand there are creatures that vary in power and knowledge. And then there's degrees to which you might trust the motives or goodness of a creature. And I just don't know how to judge those things. Um, so, so to me, common origin, the causal processes of origins is one of the ways we do seem to rely on to judge goodness. Like you talked about your parents, you know, presuming that your parents have some goodness in mind that you share, that you share their concept of goodness to some degree. And I think that's primarily based on that shared causal origin. Um, that's the reason why you presume that. Um, I don't think, and, I don't agree with that. I didn't think a causal origin can ever be a reason. And plenty of people don't listen to their parents and don't trust their parents' advice and would do the opposite of what their parents told them because they don't feel they share their parents' conception of the good. I think that some parents succeed in conveying to their children a sense of a shared normative reality and other parents don't. And the ones that succeed, those children... Now, you could think of it as brainwashing or you can think of it as education, depending on whether you think it's true or not. We have to we have to hold that question in suspension, right? Because we're looking from the outside. But the point is, it's not just that you had a shared origin. Um, it's that you, um, you know, made use of that time together uh, to at least give the impression of education. So we could just name it. There's some sort of process that produces a sense of a shared values. And that's this important process we're trying to understand and, and describe. And, you know, there's a sense in which our more distant ancestors, that process happened more strongly, more reliably. That is, they, they just more assumed a shared interest of their parents and with the God of their culture. Um, and we find that harder it seems, because when we think of various candidate gods, we're not so sure we want to embrace them as gods. And that seems that we are being pickier than our ancestors were about calling things gods and accepting them as gods. Well, one thing is, if the world changes quickly, then even if you think your parents are good and you think you have a shared, like, abstract grasp of like what a good human life is you might just totally ignore their advice because they're just they seem old-fashioned to you they're like ah you know the world you grew up in yeah this would have been good advice but you have no idea how much things have changed and so in times of change i would tend to think people would ignore their parents more and um so or their like culture more and their culture yeah um um I, I, I think that um, they might they might become more narrowly focused on just the people around them. Um, and so so a lot of those gods just might strike us like the the or the or the original God, right? That's just so passe. I mean, things were so different back then when that God made everything. Um, yeah, that God had some plans, but um, you know, things have changed since then. So this predicts that if change slows down again, then all of a sudden they'll be a lot more accepting of gods and they'll just be a lot more gods, at least the way people see it. And they'll just be a lot more agreement on what's good because it was change that caused the disagreement and change will go away. 
Right. So if it like if we wanted more harmony, we should just have less change. According to this theory, at least. Well, we managed to find something to talk about for God here. Um, I will count this as a modest, modest success for taking on just a huge big topic and diving in. Okay. Until we meet again? Yeah. Bye. Bye.